Good evening and thank you for attending this Thursday's June 3rd, 2021 Anesthesia and Analgesia webinar. My name is Toby Weingarten. I'm one of the hosts of tonight's webinar and I'm very excited that we're going to do the sleep medicine webinar, which features three articles from our recent May 21 anesthesia and analgesia sleep themed issue. First, first, I would like to thank the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine. This society has been in existence for 10 years and is made of a group of physicians and healthcare providers who are interested in the interactions between sleep medicine and anesthesia. Without their help, this past edition would not have been helpful or would not have been possible. And I would like to invite everybody to our hybrid annual meeting this October 7th and 8th in San Diego, California or online for more information regarding this fascinating combination of two different specialties. Further, if anyone has an abstract that they want to submit, please submit it now. Our portal is open and the registration will remain open through June. Now for this special um, medicine, we had three guest editors, myself, and then two very distinguished physicians who were instrumental in establishing SASM 10 years ago. Dr. Francis Chung, who's a professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Pain Medicine at the University of Health Networks. She is the, without her, we would not have had uh, SASM in existence. And we also have Dr. David Hillman, who is with us tonight. And he was instrumental in really establishing this, this understanding of sleep medicine and anesthesia and has made numerous contributions over the decades. And I'm very honored that he is co-hosting tonight's episode with me. Now I'm going to introduce the three speakers. The first speaker is myself. And I do, I realize I have a small introduction in my um, talk, but a bit of background, I am a mechanic, uh, biomedical engineer from Case Western Reserve. I went to medical school at Ohio State University. And then I completed my anesthesia residency and pain fellowship at the Mayo Clinic. I've been on the Mayo faculty for 16 years where I'm a professor of anesthesiology. I have published more than 200 peer reviewed papers and serve as the executive section editor of sleep medicine for anesthesia and analgesia. Next, I'm very happy to have Dr. Tom Altree. He uh, is a respiratory and sleep medicine physician in Aldendale, South Australia. He completed his respiratory medicine training in South Australia, followed by a sleep medicine fellowship at the Wilcock Institute of Medical Research in Sydney. Since 2020, he has been undertaking his PhD research at the Adeline Institute of Sleep Health, investigating novel pharmacologic approaches for the treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. This research aims to develop personalized treatment options based on the unique endotypes that contributed to obstructive sleep apnea. And lastly, I'm excited to welcome Dr. David Wang. Dr. Wang is a clinical associate professor in the University of Sydney, the senior scientific officer in the Department of Respiratory and Sleep Medicine, the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, and a senior research fellow in Wilcock Institute of Medical Research. He is a medical graduate from China and obtained his master's at our RMIT University in Insomnia Research and a PhD from the University of Melbourne in Clinical Sleep Medicine. A recording of this and past anesthesia and analgesia webinars will be available on the IARS YouTube channel. And any questions and answers uh, during the, the, the webinar uh, sessions, please use the Q&A button at the Zoom taskbar and at the end, the three panelists will have time to answer uh, any questions that are raised. And my name is Toby Weingarten. I'm a professor of anesthesiology at the Mayo Clinic and have been active in postoperative respiratory depressive research for over 10 years. In today's webinar, I'm going to discuss our recent paper published this May in Anesthesia and Analgesia entitled 
frequency and temporal distribution of postoperative respiratory depressive events. I do have some conflicts of interest in that I received consulting fees from Medtronic and Merck, and this study did receive some support from Medtronic in the way of use of equipment and statistical support. Postoperative respiratory depression can develop suddenly into respiratory arrest. These events can lead to permanent morbidity, such as anoxic brain injury or mortality. These catastrophic events can lead to malpractice suits, but more importantly, are devastating to the patient, family, and healthcare team. Once viewed as rare, two large studies suggest that more than 40% of postoperative patients have episodes of respiratory depression while on standard postoperative wards, the majority of which are missed by routine monitoring. Continuous monitoring of postoperative patients could help identify patients at risk for deterioration towards respiratory arrest before it occurs and allow for more timely interventions. Bo's work on this subject have focused on risk factors. The literature regarding these events of the time they occur has not been as well developed. Most of us have heard of dead in bed cases when a patient was found dead on morning rounds. Some of these cases have been attributed to mismanagement of patients with sleep disorder breathing. Francis Chung and colleagues found that sleep architecture in patients with obstructive sleep apnea worsens in this postoperative period, suggesting these events are nocturnal. However, three large retrospective studies of postoperative naloxone administration have found that administration of naloxone to reverse severe opioid side effects typically occur in the first few hours following PACU discharge. This suggests that respiratory depressive events may not be just limited to the nocturnal period. Understanding when these events occur can help us develop better postoperative monitoring strategies. To understand this current study, I need to review the Prodigy trial. This trial was the largest prospective observational study of continuous respiratory monitoring patients receiving opioids on general care floors. These patients underwent monitoring with pulse oximetry and capnography at the bedside. Output of these monitors were blinded from the regular healthcare teams who provided patients with regular care and monitoring. This study used clinical characteristics of patients and combine them with respiratory data obtained from the monitors to build a respiratory depressive depression risk prediction tool or the Prodigy score. The results of this were published in October 2020 in anesthesia and analgesia. For that study, the data obtained from these monitors were interrogated by computer algorithms for potential cases of respiratory depression. These were then manually reviewed and adjudicated as either an actual respiratory depressive episode or artifact. Then 46 potential patient characteristics were combined with this data to develop a prediction tool. The project risk prediction tool uses five clinical factors, age over 60 in decades, male sex, sleep disorder, breathing, opioid naivety, and chronic heart failure, and then assigns patients into low, intermediate, or high cat risk categories. This model works well with a area under the curve of 0.762. Because the aim of the initial Prodigy trial was to devise a risk stratification tool for which patients developed respiratory depression, data for each patient was analyzed only until the first respiratory depressive episode was identified. Thus, a large amount of data from the Prodigy trial remains unanalyzed. It was a perception of those of us who mainly reviewed the data that there was many patients that usually had multiple episodes. So in this current study, we wanted to use some unanalyzed data to address questions regarding the timing of the episodes. Our primary aim was to develop a temporal map of these events in regards to both the end of surgery and time of day. We also wanted to quantify how many patients, how many episodes occurred per patient, and if these correlated with the Prodigy score. Because of the time it took to review episodes, we only limited our study to Brigham Women's and Ohio State University. This is a typical capnography and pulse oximetry tracing of a patient exhibiting respiratory depressive signs. The, top, the panel on the top is capnography of expired carbon dioxide obtained from a specialized nasal cannula that can sample breath from a patient. The axis on the bottom is time, and the vertical line is approximately one minute long. The vertical axis is the detected carbon dioxide level in millimeters of mercury. The bottom panel is data from a pulse oximeter with SpO2 in red and heart rate in green. What you see on the top panel are strong exhalations clustered together followed by weak or no exhalations, which are apneic spells. Then these are followed by arousal episodes where there's a strong cluster of, of breaths. 
Each one of these short acting spells is associated with the corresponding decrease in the oxyhemoglobin levels where the SpO2 can drop to lower saturations in the 80s, 70s, and even 60s. But these quickly normalize when the patient arouses and begins to take deep breaths. Each episode is associated with also a release in catecholamine and stress hormones manifested by fluctuating heart rate. And this is one of the reasons why patients with sleep disordered breathings, oftentimes other diseases such as hypertension, diabetes, NASH, and heart failure. In this study, all respiratory depressive episodes were mainly reviewed, and these were designated as initial events or subsequent events. These were time stamped and placed into two hour increments and then displayed on 24 hour radar plots and inspected for peak concentrations. The clock of all the respiratory depressive episodes potentially had two peaks. So we did further analysis to determine that these two peaks were statistically different. Also a prodigy score was calculated for each patient. So in this study, we identified 2,539 episodes with a median of two episodes per patient. 155 patients had an episode and of these, 136 had multiple episodes. One patient was even observed to have 545 events in one hour, in one uh, day. The median duration of monitoring was 22.3 hours, and the time when the monitor was started from the end of surgery was 4.3 hours. To answer the question when respiratory depressive events occurred, we distributed them on this 24 hour clock. This clock shows time from midnight, 6 a.m., 12 p.m., and 6 p.m. on the quadrants. And as you go from the center to the periphery, you increase the number of events. So in this one, we go from zero to 75. The first episode of respiratory depression is shown in a blue line, and the end of surgery is shown in the red line. The initial respiratory depressive episode occurred a mean of 8.8 .8 hours postoperatively. The peak end of surgery was at noon, but the peak occurrence of these events were between 4 and 8 p.m. Unfortunately, because there was a four hour delay in applying the monitor to um, the patients, there is a period of time where the patients were not monitored. And I think some patients probably had undetected episodes during this time, which will become more apparent with the next slide. So this bar graph depicts the time after surgery, initial events and all events. The initial events are shown in maroon bars and all events are shown in the lighter purple bars. You can see that a large number of subsequent events also occurred when the initial events just happened. This supports the theory that if we began monitoring these patients earlier, we would have detected more cases. The 24 hour clock here is a little different in that the magnitude is greater. This one goes from zero to 350 patients. It shows that there are events with two potential peaks one at 6 p.m. and then another one at 4 a.m. And in order to determine if these two peaks were different, uh, we performed this post hoc analysis where each uh, two hour segment was looked at. And we saw that there was a statistically increased risk of having respiratory depressive events at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., and 6 a.m. The 6 p.m. event only trended towards significance. Lastly, we calculated a prodigy score for each patient. 40% of patients had a low score, 32% an intermediate score, and 28% a high score. The number of patients who had a respiratory depressive event increased by score. Now, the median number of events per patient increased with higher scores. So you can see a low score, the score was zero median, an intermediate one episode per patient, but the high score, it was five, and that was different than the other two scores. So important observations from this study were that episodes of respiratory depression were rarely isolated. Initial episodes of respiratory depression occur in the late afternoon and early evenings, and these are also accompanied by a large number of additional episodes. When considering all episodes, the peak occurrence is in the early morning. And lastly, the number of episodes correlates with the prodigy score. The observation that patients had multiple episodes in this study was consistent with those by Sun et al. from the Cleveland Clinic, where hypoxemia was detected for prolonged periods of time in patients in post-surgical wards. It is also supported by the uh, observations by Francis Chung that there is an increased number of central sleep apneas on the post-operative night. 
When looking at the timing of events, two retrospective studies of postoperative naloxone administration for Mayo Clinic Rochester found that more than 50% of naloxone administrations occurred within the first 12 postoperative hours. So in conclusion, postoperative respiratory depressive events are frequent, typically undetected, and rarely isolated. These events begin to occur in the first few hours after surgery, usually in the late afternoon, but maximum frequency occurs in the early morning hours. This suggests that the best time to begin monitoring a patient is upon leaving the PACU and not initiate this at nighttime. Here's a list of our references, and there'll be an opportunity for questions at the end of uh, today's webinar. So my name is Tom, a respiratory and sleep physician at the Adelaide Institute for Sleep Health um, in Adelaide, which is right down the bottom of South Australia. Nice little city of a little over a million people surrounded by parklands. So what we're talking about, um, vulnerability to post-operative complications in obstructive sleep apnea, the importance of phenotypes. And I'll quickly um, go over a quick overview of obstructive sleep apnea before delving into the four key traits that um, contribute to OSA pathophysiology and then talk about those traits and their vulnerability in the post-operative setting. Obstructive sleep apnea is a common, highly prevalent condition um, characterized by repetitive repeated narrowing or collapse of the upper airway. And this polysomnogram nicely shows a long apnea lasting for one minute with um, uh, um, uh, nasal pressure um, showing that there's no flow during that apnea, but um, persistent respiratory and abdominal muscle effort. Um, and then at the end of the apnea, the apnea is ceased by a cortical arousal, leading to um, um, resumption of uh, airway flow. And this person had severe obstructive sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is common in people undergoing surgery, and often um, it is not diagnosed at the time of surgery. And even in people without obstructive sleep apnea, they can develop OSA postoperatively as well. And obstructive sleep apnea is increased with an, uh, is associated with an increased risk of postoperative complications, especially cardiac, respiratory, uh, and, and need for intensive care unit um, admission. There are four key phenotypes that contribute to obstructive sleep apnea pathophysiology. Everybody has at least to some degree um, an uh, upper airway collapsibility or an impaired upper airway anatomy. But there are three other non-anatomical phenotypes that also significantly contribute to obstructive sleep apnea pathophysiology. And the degree to which these phenotypes contribute varies from person to person. They include a high loop gain or ventilatory control, instability, a low arousal threshold, and impaired upper airway dilator muscles. So I'll go through these four phenotypes in turn. The first is impaired upper airway anatomy. And adipose tissue deposition is really important um, as a risk factor for this. So on the left here, this MRI shows someone with um, normal BMI and no obstructive sleep apnea, and they have uh, obviously a, a, a very open um, airway that's not collapsible. Whereas on the right, this person with um, obesity has a lot of fat deposition in the tongue muscle um, and a reduction in airway um, space there behind the tongue, and they also have obst uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea. Craniofacial shape and size is also a significant risk factor, uh, especially people with uh, a short mandible. And body and head position contributes. Uh, the upper airway is more collapsible in the supine position and in the head flexed position. Um, and fluid distribution 
from the dependent areas um, uh, in the supine position up into the pharyngeal tissues uh, plays a significant uh, impact on upper airway collapsibility as well. The upper airway dilator muscles are muscles that surround the upper airway. Um, and there are many, many different muscles, but important ones include the genius glossus muscle and, ten and tensor palatini. And they contract um, and cause dilation of the upper airway. And they increase their activity levels in response to airway narrowing and negative pharyngeal pressures during wake and during sleep. So here are a couple of um, figures that show this quite nicely. In A, this person is asleep using CPAP and they have normal upper airway dilator muscle responses. The muscles have EMG electrodes in them, the genia glossus and the tensor palatini. And after a few breaths, the CPAP level, if it's abruptly dropped, will lead to a reduction in airflow as there's upper airway collapsibility. But the genia glossus and the tensor palatini muscle activity increases in response to the respiratory stimulus, leading to dilation of the upper airway and restoration of airflow. Whereas in someone with impaired upper airway dilator muscle activity under the same circumstances, if CPAP is abruptly reduced, then there is no compensatory increase in upper airway dilator muscle activity until enough of a respiratory stimulus builds up that there is a cortical arousal, the person wakes up and then the airway muscle activity goes back to wakefulness levels. So this person would be um, uh, at high risk of developing obstructive sleep apnea. A low respiratory arousal threshold is an important phenotype in obstructive sleep apnea. Arousals are important responses to respiratory stimuli, but not all respiratory stimuli require an arousal in order to have airway patency restored. About 20% of respiratory events restore um, or resolve without an arousal, and that's because the airway dilator muscles and other compensatory mechanisms are able to compensate before an arousal occurs. But if you are especially sensitive to um, those respiratory events, then arousals may occur before your other compensatory mechanisms have time to restore airway patency. And, and this is seen in about 35% of people with obstructive sleep apnea, and they tend to have lower BMIs and tend to have mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea. High loop gain is the fourth phenotype. Loop gain is a term um, used in engineering, but also has been borrowed from engineering and used in respiratory medicine to describe the ratio of the ventilatory response to a disturbance such as a high CO2. And a high loop gain um, is defined as a ventilatory response that is out of proportion to the ventilatory stimulus. And high loop gain symptoms are prone to oscillations like fluctuations in CO2 levels and are inherently unstable. So in this figure on the right here, in figure A, this person has low loop gain. This person is asleep with CPAP and um, the line there marks their airflow. So here they are breathing along. They have seven or eight breaths before CPAP levels are reduced. And this causes a breathing disturbance with a reduction in airflow that over a few breaths increases to a new steady state. If therapeutic CPAP is reintroduced, then there's an increase in airflow um, until breathing returns to baseline after a few breaths. Whereas in a high loop gain system, under the same circumstances, when the breathing disturbance um, uh, is no longer there, when therapeutic CPAP is reintroduced, there's an excessive breathing response 
which leads to a reduction in respiratory drive, driving the CO2 level below the apneic threshold, leading to an apnea. And this pattern can occur again and again and again throughout sleep. So how are these four traits specifically vulnerable to post-operative complications? Well, firstly, impaired upper airway anatomy's gold standard treatment is CPAP therapy. But we know that post-operative CPAP compliance is poor, and there are a number of reasons for this. It's very difficult for head and neck surgical patients to be able to tolerate obstructive sleep apnea. There may be physical barriers to obstructive sleep apnea, such as nasogastric tubes, which mean that it's impossible to get a good seal. Rostral fluid shifts, especially in people with cardiac failure and renal impairment, can significantly contribute to upper airway collapsibility when the person is uh, in the supine position uh, in the post-operative setting. And the effect of opioids on the upper airway anatomy is a little unclear. Um, there is conflicting evidence, but it seems that at high doses of opioids, especially if they are combined with other CNS depressants, will likely worsen upper airway stability in the post-operative setting. Again, there is conflicting evidence on the effect of opioids on upper airway dilator muscle function. Animal studies clearly show that upper airway dilator muscle function is reduced, but there is limited data in humans. Um, and only one really well-designed study of 40 people with obstructive sleep apnea that specifically looked at the effect of a single dose of 40 milligrams of morphine on uh, genoglossus and tensor palatina EMG levels and didn't show any significant change. But that's only one study with one dose. Neuromuscular blocking agents um, do reduce genioglossus function even when uh, there is only very mild or partial blockade um, and incomplete reversal um, is likely to worsen upper airway dilator muscle function postoperatively. The effect of opioids on the arousal threshold is interesting. Um, in people with a low arousal threshold phenotype, it's expected that opioids would paradoxically um, reduce OSA severity by increasing the arousal threshold. And this is extrapolated by clear evidence using sedatives and hypnotics in people with a low arousal threshold who have um, less severe obstructive sleep apnea when these drugs are given. However, um, obviously care needs to be taken because in people with a normal or a high arousal threshold, opioids would be expected to increase the risk of opioid induced ventilatory impairment. So this leads me to make the point and stress the point that characterizing phenotypes is going to be an increasingly important part of how we manage obstructive sleep apnea, not only in the post-operative setting, but in general. The effect of opioids on loop gain um, are to reduce the ventilatory response to hypercapnia in obstructive sleep apnea, but there is very limited evidence um, uh, to guide this statement. Um, high loop gain with mild to moderate obstructive sleep apnea may paradoxically improve with opioids. And we know that oxygen, uh, supplemental oxygen reduces peripheral chemoreceptor responsiveness to hypoxia and hypercapnia. And so giving oxygen in people with a high loop gain would be expected to reduce their severity postoperatively but obviously care needs to be um, uh, made in this setting given the risk of CO2 retention. So to conclude, not everybody with obstructive sleep apnea has the same underlying um, disease pathophysiology. Obstructive sleep apnea leads to an increased risk of post-operative complications but the individual's mix of underlying OSA phenotypic traits 
means that they may react differently to post-operative risk factors such as opioids. And so in order for us to deliver safe, personalized obstructive sleep apnea care, it's going to be important for us in the future to be able to characterize OSA phenotypes. Thank you very much. I look forward to answering any questions at the end of the session. Thank you for the opportunity to present here. Um, I'd like to share my experience of um, uh, uh, chronic opioid use and uh, uh, central sleep apnea. Um, uh, we all know that opioids are very commonly used for pain management and uh, uh, paraoperative procedures and addiction treatment. Um, uh, there's a current um, opioid epidemic in America. Um, the average about one in three um, adult Americans are taking opioid uh, every year. Um, and then there's a, a marked increase in uh, opioid-related death as well. Um, since about um, year 2000 also, um, chronic opioid users have been reported to have a um, central sleep apnea um, using the uh, PSG studies, about 20 to 30 percent of chronic opioid users. And um, um, now uh, we have uh, recognized that opioid-related central sleep apnea is one of the two uh, most commonly seen uh, central sleep apnea um, besides heart failure related uh, change of uh, breathing. So what do they look like? Um, they could look like a periodic breathing type of central sleep apnea or non-periodic breathing type of central sleep apnea. Um, um, uh, if in PSG study it marked as a um, nasal pressure channel with a zero um, flow and a thoracic and uh, abdominal channel they have zero um, uh, respiratory effort as well. Um, uh, the, so the central apnea index higher than five. And then um, uh, also the central um, apnea and central hypopnea need to be higher than 50% of uh, the respiratory event. Um, we call that uh, central sleep apnea. We have to talk about a toxic breathing as well because they share um, I, I often come with a central sleep apnea. Uh, about 92% of uh, um, chronic opioid users um, with uh, MMAE higher than uh, 200 milligrams have a, um, a toxic breathing. And um, um, some of the toxic breathing events you can see, um, such as for the example, um, the, these um, stop breathing for 11 seconds, which more than 10 seconds. And then uh, this event itself, we can qualify a um, central sleep apnea. So the passive physiology of opioid induced central sleep apnea uh, is uh, generated in the uh, brain stem and uh, modulated by the input from uh, conscious input um, and then central and peripheral uh, chemoreceptors. But during sleep, there's a lack of uh, uh, conscious input. So the pathogenesis of opioid induced central sleep apnea can be mainly explained from two aspects which is a respiratory region generation and then chemoreceptors. The most um, sensitive aspect of opioid effect on uh, respiration is on uh, region uh, generation, uh, which is more sensitive than tidal volume change. Um, so a small area in uh, Amidala is called pre uh complex. It's uh, a major generator of a uh, respiratory region. Um, it couples with uh, uh, a nearby uh, respiratory group called RTNPFRG. Um, um, uh, this coupled from respiratory oscillations. The pre postinger comple uh, complex is active during inspiration and uh, it is sensitive to opioid and inhibited by opioids, uh, slowing down the uh, inspiratory drive. Uh, in contrast, uh, the RTN. Uh, PFRG is active during expiration, but um, it's not sensitive to opioid. So this paradoxical effect on uh, different brain regions is a major mechanism for the um, irregular respiratory uh, reason. 
um, uh, opioid during opioid, um, uh, 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 during opioid use. Uh, the other aspect is the vintage chemo reflex. Um, this uh, graph shows um, uh, the um, theoretical um, um, the, uh, 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 the conceptual um, like, uh, um, effect of what chemo receptors, um, such as after um, each uh, breathing, the PCO2 will drop below apnea threshold. Uh, for example, this arrow here, uh, the PC, uh, the X axis is uh, um, it's a PCO2 and the Y axis is the ventilation. When I reach apnea threshold, the ventilation is zero. It's stop breathing. Um, and um, But after a stop breathing uh, like during sleep, the PCO2 still increase um, until reach um, the crossing point, which is uh, the metabolic uh, hyperbolia. Um, then uh, breathing will resume again. This threshold we call eupneic threshold. So the different PCO2 difference between the apneic threshold and eupneic threshold, we call that a CO2 reserve. Normally, it's a narrower CO2 reserve. Um, the um, more unstable um, uh, breathing is, and then the slope uh, we call chemosensitivity. Um, a similar concept is a, a loop gain. So the sharper uh, slope, the higher chemosensitivity, the higher loop gain, the more unstable uh, breathing. For example, the um, example we show in this now, this is the, the panel A. Um, the, uh, um, obviously, there's a hyperventilation, and um, which causes a ventilatory overshoot and then uh, stop breathing for 10 seconds, and another hyperventilation overshoot, and the PCO2 reach apnea threshold, stop breathing. Um, so, um, it, it, um, this um, example will um, uh, quite obviously will have a high chemosensitivity and a high gain. Um, the panel B um, may not have a high chemosensitivity, just one breath already cross uh, the apnea threshold and stop breathing, and another two breaths um, and then stop breathing again. So the, the, this example shows a quite sensitive apnea thresholds, and um, uh, um, the patient may not have high chemosensitivity. So there are different phenotypes of opioid-induced central sleep apnea. It could be um, there's uh, different phenotypes. Um, it's based on their pathogenesis may lead to different clinical consequences and then treatment strategies. Um, and such as the example we showed this now, the high chemosensitivity, hydrogen uh, phenotype, or the um, sensitive CO2 apnea threshold with narrow CO2 reserve um, phenotype. Or uh, there could be another um, phenotype, which is blunted hypercapnic uh, response, which is a uh, um, hypercapnic or hyperventilation central sleep apnea. Um, um, yeah, study we conducted in uh, 2005, uh, which reported in the chronic uh, methadone users, they have significantly increased hypoxic ventilatory response, um, nearly doubled compared to normal controls, but they have significantly blunted hypocapnic ventilatory uh, response, um, uh, which is central chemosensitivity. Um, but come to individuals, people could have a different combination. They could have a very high hypoxic ventilatory um, response or very low hypocapnic ventilatory response. For individuals, they can be um, uh, tested um, by a weak ventilatory chemo reflect test. Um, this photo is uh, the setting um, in Royal Prince Alfred Hospital uh, where um, uh, I'm working. There are also different genotypes sensitive to opioid response. There are three um, um, potential useful um, candidate genes are uh, ABCB1, OPRM1, and uh, HDR3B. Um, whereas uh, the a, ABCB1 and the OPRM1, they are the two key genes um, involving opioid pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics, uh, respectively. Um, and also, our recent uh, uh, RCD trial has demonstrated that OPRM1 variants uh, have different response to acute morphine in a uh, hypnic ventilatory response uh, and uh, the oxygen um, desaturation during sleep um, in OSA patients. 
So the um, most convincing evidence for risk factor of opioid induced intrastitic apnea come from the um, perspective of multicenter um, study, which is conducted by Professor Francis Chong. Um, this is an OPSAFE study. Um, uh, they found the significant predictive factor for central apnea index higher than five, um, more than uh, milligram equivalent, um, uh, which is uh, MME and um, um, daytime oxygen uh, saturation, uh, which is hypoxia. Uh, so for each 10 milligram of MME increase, the order of um, central amnia increase, um, higher than five increase by 3%, and for each 5% drop in SpO2, that's always increased by 45%. Um, the other uh, concomitant trial in fact of uh, um, uh, 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 which commonly um, use uh, benzodiazepines and uh, antidepressants. Uh, these are quite complex and then um, I do not have a, um, like a consistent uh, finding in different studies. Some study found antidepressants can increase central apnea index, and the other um, the studies found that benzodiazepines could reduce central sleep apnea, but other studies didn't find this. The clinical consequence of opioids induced central sleep apnea, um, this is a quite tricky question. Um, we did not find any direct evidence showing any major clinical consequence um, from central sleep apnea in chronic opioid users. Um, in the two heavyweight study, one is at the body center oxygen study, compared to a um, patient with um, central apnea index lower than five, uh, those central, uh, those uh, patients with um, central sleep apnea have no significant difference in occurrence of uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, hypertension, diabetes, and this back uh, the central apnea uh, group have almost three times of opioid dose. Um, it's somewhat, we can somewhat speculate that maybe they have even protective effect because they have such high opioid dose and then, um, but they do not have um, adverse events. Um, in the other large cohort of uh, 6,000 central sleep apnea um, patient, um, all cause central sleep apnea was associated 1.5 times higher levels of uh, uh, cardiac hospital nation. Uh, this is um, quite understandable because they included uh, um, chain stop respiration, heart failure, is, um, uh, chain stop respiration as well. And for chronic opioid users, they have 1.17 times the increase of all of uh, cardiac uh, animation. Uh, this is uh, understandable as well. We all know all chronic opioid users um, have a significant like uh, side effect. However, those chronic opioid users with central sleep apnea did not have um, increased all of um, um, cardiac events. So this come to an a, um, important like, suggestion whether um, uh, it's a, the central sleep apnea is beneficial or, or detrimental. If judged from physiology, um, like a chronic opioid uh, use related central sleep apnea as mainly a voltage control phenomenon, um, it's with an increased hypoxic ventricular response, chemosensitivity, and increased loop gain as a long-term stimulation from the opioid-induced um, hypoxia. So it's a, a compensatory feedback response to keep um, blood gas normal. So it's um, a beneficial rather than um, detrimental. And, and similar is increasingly recognized that a uh, heart failure related chain of breathing um, is um, um, consequences, uh, which is um, have a um, compensatory um, uh, mechanism, which is more beneficial than uh, injuries, um, uh, as reported in the Forex by uh, another Austrian researcher, Matthew Norton. This clinical treatment of opioid induced central sleep apnea, um, the most commonly used are positive airway pressure uh, therapy, such as FIX um, CPAP, um, or bad level, um, uh, or uh, ASV, which is uh, specifically designed for central sleep apnea treatment. We know uh, fixed pressure uh, CPAP and then by level they can improve like, hypoxia and then uh, reduce high loop gain and then uh, reduce over, over overshoots and then thus um, 
um, reduce central sleep apnea. Uh, but there are some uh, residual central sleep apnea. So um, ASV with the, the adaptive silver ventilation was developed just specifically for treating central sleep apnea. Um, however, the, uh, the uh, recent ASV trial, the CERF uh, HIF trial, they tested 1,300 heart failure patients. So despite ASV, the successfully eliminated central sleep apnea, the, the chain stop breathing, all cause and cardiovascular mortality, um, uh, mortality was significantly increased. Um, so that means reducing by reducing central sleep apnea may not mean they have clean, uh, they have improved clinical consequences. It could be even worse clinical consequences. So there are two issues involved. One is that uh, um, um, this uh, treatment are based on the uh, premise that central sleep apnea in chronic opioid users is detrimental, but that may not be the case. If, uh, based on the uh, passive physiology that we discussed just now. Second is uh, treatment success evaluations, mainly based on reducing the number of central sleep apnea event rather than clinical consequences, um, such as uh, cardiovascular or neurocognitive outcome. Um, this is um, uh, those clinical consequences. Um, um, it should be more important uh, outcomes. So in summary, um, opioid-induced central sleep apnea is one of the two most commonly seen central sleep apnea, but has been a significant understudy. Um, so some of the key uh, questions remain to be answered. One is um, um, like uh, uh, the uh, phenotyping and the genotyping of central sleep apnea, or we should research form to guide a target tr a treatment solution. Um, the other is uh, we need to prove whether central sleep apnea in chronic opioid users is detrimental or beneficial. Uh, the third is um, uh, some study like uh, CERV HF, uh, which is uh, a um, was a design for the chain stop respiration heart failure patient. Uh, um, this trial could be um, used to test um, opioid um, induced central sleep apnea uh, treatment in the clinical outcome as well. But um, what my belief, my, my personal belief is, uh, um, is um, um, the, is a um, chronic opioid central sleep apnea is a consequence of uh, um, it's a consequence, but not a cause. Uh, we don't treat consequence. We should treat the cause, which is um, like uh, opioid and induced hypoxia. Um, um, that's a uh, cause. Um, we don't treat consequence. Thank you. Well, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Altree and Dr. Wang for those excellent uh, presentations. Um, I see some, some questions are um, uh, being generated. Um, do you want to um, start with some questions, Dr. Hillman? Yes, I'd like to start with a question for you, um, Dr. Weingarten. Um, in your series, um, 155 uh, of your 250 patients had had um, uh, respiratory episodes postoperatively, uh, leaving, of course, 95 that didn't. Uh, it, do, would you like to speculate or inform us as to what, what might have protected those people against events? Are, are the characteristics that you can define from those that haven't had events that might um, be predictive of protection against events postoperatively. This was a sub-study of the Prodigy um, larger study, which was uh, published back in October in ANA. And in that study, we looked at uh, 16 different sites across three continents and uh, evaluated 40 uh, six different patient characteristics and developed a risk prediction score uh, to the, determine the risk for respiratory depressive events as observed with capnography and pulse oximetry. 
And what we found is that age over 60, opioid naivety, male sex, congestive heart failure, and sleep disordered breathing were all risk factors that would in, in, uh, could be used to calculate a prodigy risk score. Now, this sub-study that we did was in two sites that were used, so there's a bit of you know, internal um, questions there, but we also found that with higher prodigy risk scores, a greater proportion of patients did develop uh, respiratory depression. What's very interesting though, in the first study, we just looked at did patients have one episode, yes or no. In this one, we assessed how many patients had episodes, if they had multiple episodes or a single episode. And patients who had a high prodigy risk score had a median of five episodes during monitoring where patients who had a low risk score was zero and intermediate score was one. So it appears that you know, patients who do have a higher risk score using this Prodigy tool are more at risk for having episodes and more at risk for having multiple episodes. Um, so for example, one patient we encountered had over 500 episodes in a 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... You, you must have learned quite a lot about the uh, uh, practicability of these sorts of measurements, um, that is post-op of capnography and oximetry um, uh, over, over this series of um, studies. Would you like to comment uh, about that? Where do you see post-operative monitoring going? Particularly post-operative monitoring uh, on the general floor as opposed to high dependency areas. There's a number of challenges for continually monitoring patients. Um, traditionally, cost and technology have been quoted as, as major impediments, but with increasing, um, you know, as, as technology progresses, these barriers are, are going away. Um, the, the second question is, um, are the patients going to tolerate the particular monitor that you're, you're wearing? With the capnography device, we did have a, a bit of noise. I think patients took off the nasal cannula and that did generate false alarm. So that would be one challenge to bedside capnography. However, especially patients who are on supplemental oxygen, pulse oximetry alone may be insufficient to detect in these respiratory depressive episodes because most that we encountered was apnea, which would have been missed on a patient receiving supplemental oxygen with a pulse oximetry. So I'm of the opinion that if a patient is on a nasal cannula, capnography can be achieved. Great. Um, let, let's move along to uh, some of the other speakers now. Uh, Dr. Chung's on, uh, come online and she's um, asked a similar question of, uh, of, of you about monitoring capnography in practice. I think that um, um, you've answered that. Perhaps we can move on to her, her uh, second question, which is for Dr. Altree. That is, how in practice do you see determination of these different phenotypes occurring? What, what, what are the sorts of, perhaps in, in, in preoperative evaluation, a bit of future gazing, uh, determining um, the phenotypic characteristics of the patients presenting for surgery? Yeah, thanks, David, and thanks, Francis, and, and yeah, absolutely. This is very much future gazing because at present the um, the gold standard measurement of these phenotypes all involves invasive um, measurements in the in the research setting. But um, there is the starting to be the development of non-invasive methods to characterise mm -hmm. phenotype uh, traits, um, and so. Um, what, what we're starting to use is a, a, a kind of a computing and signal processing method that was developed by Scott Sands and his group. There's a, there's a nice paper in the 2018 American Journal of um, Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine that it kind of explains his method. And um, the, the beauty of that is that you can use just a standard sleep study. Uh, and I know that it's difficult to, to be able to do sleep studies quickly in, in the preoperative setting for people with potentially high risk before they have their surgery. But um, for, for those patients who do have sleep studies, we are going to be able to use or to apply these kind of computer um, signal processing methods um, 
in a, in a clinical setting in the future, hopefully not in the not too distant future, to be able to characterize um, uh, those four different traits that I spoke about. And to what extent will you be able to do that from um, uh, low, uh, level three, level four type um, uh, sleep studies? And that, that is the, um, the, the sort of respiratory data only type sleep studies, which are likely to be the, the preoperative norm if, if, if more extensive sleep setting comes in. Yeah. And Based on the current methodology, we're going to be limited in the amount of information that we can draw from type three and four studies because they don't have um, they don't have EEG. And, and one of the important kind of inputs for these for these signal processing methods is is looking at the the length of arousals. That that's one of the things that gets put into the the algorithm that helps to helps to give information about phenotypes. So. Um, um, ideally, a, a level one or level two study is, is what's needed at present. Um, and yeah, it would be difficult to, to get all of that information from the more limited sleep studies. Is there any, any uh, difference in the res respiratory pattern, um, the, the, the resumption of breathing, the pattern of the resumption of breathing between one associated with an arousal and one without? Um, in other words, could, could you can you envisage a, 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 a perhaps deriving this information from a study that doesn't have EEG in it? Yeah, I mean the, the degree of uh, ventilatory response um, to an arousal is 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 definitely different. Um, so if someone has a has an apnea, then the then the um, respiratory rate and the tidal volume will increase post arousal. Um, I'm not, I'm not aware of any, um, any method that kind of uses that to be able to get very good quality detail about things like arousal threshold, but, um, for potentially, potentially yes, but, but, um, I'm not quite sure at the moment, David. Yeah. I, 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 I guess, uh, without prolonging this, uh, too much, um, the abruptness of the um, of the resumption of breathing. Uh, any difference between those um, that in those that arouse and those that don't? Um, not 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 too sure, David. But definitely the degree that the the, the magnitude of of the um, the respiratory response after after an arousal is definitely bigger. Right. Now, let's go on to our next question now. That is, um, this is a general question, I think, that um, uh, goes to the, uh, to the panel, and any one of you can um, pick this up. But do you suggest any specific consideration for patients with central sleep apnea postoperatively other than pulse ox monitoring? So, um, a patient with uh, perhaps um, perhaps we'll go to David Wang, a patient with central sleep apnea. Um, do you, um, do you uh, think that um, they should have any particular monitoring? Is there any particular um, uh, requirements for them? Uh, for central sleep apnea, yeah. uh, uh, do they have? Uh, do they require to have? Uh, um, specific um, monitoring like post-operatively or, or, or just uh, for chronic opioid use? Uh, I think, think that going, perhaps going from the patients that you described that have central sleep apnea with opioids, what sort of post-operative um, uh, monitoring range would you envisage for them? Any, anything special? Um, it's um, a bit different between like a post-operative um, and um, uh, chronic op uh, opioid use, central sleep apnea, because of uh, a post-opioid, um, a post-operative uh, that's a, a opio um, that's a acute, that's a acute um, a opioid use, um, is uh, quite different to uh, chronic opioid use. A cro chronic opioid user, they quite often have a um, Develop significant central sleep apnea um, because they have a higher 
um, hypoxic ventilatory response could come from the long-term uh, chronic opioid use, like a stimulation, and so they have higher hypoxic uh, ventilatory um, uh, response use and they develop a high rate gain and uh, overshoot. Um, but for ac acute opioid use, which is uh, the post-operative, um, they could have a like, central sleep apnea as well. But um, with acute opioid use, you could have both blunted hypoxic and have capnic for ventilatory response. That's the acute use. Um, so they may not have a, a high hypoxic ventilatory response and high root gain, which is uh, the second the sec lead um, um, form of um, um, overshoot type of uh, central sleep apnea. It, it could be a um, different pattern. It could be like a, just a one or two breaths and stop breathing, and one or two breaths and stop breathing. And then quite often could be scattered um, central sleep apnea event rather than the frequent high central apnea index because to be qualified for a um, um, high central apnea index, you need to have a high loop gain to have the, um, the cyclic pattern. But for acute use, it's um, hard to use, uh, hard to have the high loop gain and the high chemical sensitivity to have that pattern. Um, so it will be difficult to have the high, um, really frequent central apnea index. Uh, you could have a uh, scatter. Uh, central apnea index, and you could have a hypoventilation um, type of central sleep apnea, but the central apnea index may not be high, um, but it could be least or low <laughs> because of the event could be longer. Um, it could be longer event, um, but it's not frequent. Um, it could be, uh, there's a, another factor could be the uh, research change of arousal threshold as well. Um, but it's uh, a different concept with uh, the chronic opioid use induced the frequent high central apnea index, central sleep apnea. Uh, perhaps back to you, uh, Thomas, on, the, on, a, on a similar sort of a theme. Um, to what, you know, the, one of the uh, dichotomies evident in your presentation um, is this sort of attitude towards uh, uh, arousal thresholds from the point of view of sleep medicine where perhaps a, um, a lower arousal threshold is seen as a, a nuisance because it, uh, it tends to um, um, uh, uh, lead to a lot of sleep disruption. Um, whereas on the other hand, in, in anesthesia, um, uh, a lower arousal threshold might be seen as protective. Would you like to sort of make some commentary on that sort of issue? Or, well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Can absolutely. we come to agreement on that? On that, 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 in the uh, in the perioperative environment, I guess. Yeah. Look, um, it, it it partly comes down to um, the the degree of of sedation postoperatively. I mean, obviously, um, in the postoperative setting, an arousal is is a critical um, um, mechanism to allow uh, for restoration of airway patency. So, you know, it, it's, 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 it's critically important. Um, but we do know that there is a subset of people outside of the post-operative setting whose, um, whose obstructive sleep apnea is significantly contributed to by their lower arousal threshold. So um, feasibly, there is a group of people who who may have um, lower arousal threshold in that post-operative setting who wouldn't um, be as at higher risk of the sedating effects from opioids and, and other, other sedative medications. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't, don't want to be too um, strong here in, in, in the post-operative setting because obviously that is a high risk situation and, um, and, and care needs to be made that we're, we're not leading to the risk of over sedating patients post-operatively. But I guess outside of the post-operative setting, it's an important um, concept to understand that, 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 that the lower arousal threshold is a contributor to OSA severity. Is there any, are you aware of any, ever, any um, data that 
tracks um, post-operative vulnerability um, in relationship to arousal thresholds? Um, personally, I am not. And um, it, 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 it would be very interesting to know if um, the, the individual mixture of an individual's traits that contribute to sleep apnea, if they are the same in the preoperative setting and the postoperative setting, or if there are changes to those in the postoperative setting as well. That, that kind of uh, links into to Kent Moore's question here about uh, if there are any comments regarding open airway anesthesia implications for the various OSA phenotypes, um, which I'm not, I personally am not aware of any um, um, phenotype characterization studies that, that look at different types of anesthesia in the post-operative setting, but um, I think it kind of gets to, it's kind of posing an important question. What, what are the changes that anesthesia and different medications of the post-operative setting um, have on the individual mix of traits that contribute to an individual's sleep apnea and whether or not they change from pre or post. And if they do, then that's important to know um, post-operatively in terms of uh, risk. Yeah, so it's really, really, I think your presentation and, uh, and uh, Dr. Weingarten's presentation, all, all three presentations really are, uh, represent a bit of a challenge to us um, that there's there's more we've got more hooks into sleep apnea than simply uh, observing these respiratory patterns and perhaps that's a uh, that's the kind of key to better characterizing those people at post-operative risk do you, do you want to want to kind of com make comment on that generally and perhaps as an, invite the other panelists to do so too Perhaps let's go to Dr. Weingarten uh, first and uh, take it from there. Well, I'm going to put on my ANA editor's hat um, and, uh, and and you know having edited uh, these these past uh, papers for the for our recent edition, you know th there's a lot of unknown questions about which patients are at risk, how to best monitor them, and uh, that's exciting that we don't fully know, we don't fully understand um, how to target these, these therapies and uh, monitoring strategies. And, um, you know, the work uh, done by uh, Dr. Wang and Dr. Altry, you know, in this to try to understand really the, 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 the phenotype, which I then would think would lead to, to better understanding of the cause of, of these complications so we can keep patients safely. Uh, say for having anesthetics is is really where uh, our our focus needs to be now, and I, I want to thank both of you for your your, your excellent uh, articles um, for this edition, and uh, I encourage everyone who who is uh, listening or listening in the future to really you know ask these hard questions and and um, you know conduct well uh, well performed studies so we can get a better understanding of these for the interim. Um, I, I think that the future is going to be post-operative monitoring. Um, so until we have a better understanding of this, the more people we monitor, probably the, the safer patients will be, um, but a lot of work that we still need to do. Mm -hmm. do, you, do, I, either, uh, do you want to add to that, uh, David? Um, yeah, for the... Um for the um, monitoring. I, um, um, yeah, uh, I think it's uh, important to do um, uh, two things. There's a first, uh, like uh, the, the clinical uh, phenotyping and then like uh, a, a genotyping as well. Um, like a genotyping, uh, like we, we, uh, we talk about like when tissue control just now, which could have a different pattern. Um, um, like uh, if in daytime awake when tissue chemo response test, we can like uh, test through uh, those patients, but it's not, not quite pra practically um, um, to to test all the like patient before uh, like operations and when tissue um, control um, uh, 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 as a winter chemo reflex, it's not quite uh, 
are plausible, but uh, um, maybe you could um, um, look into the, the breathing pattern, uh, like the example what I showed just now, like uh, uh, through my, uh, my chest study in 2005, uh, if it's a uh, um, periodic breathing type of central sleep apnea or just uh, one or two breath and stop breathing. Um, and through this, uh, like uh, maybe um, we could have more of um, 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 the mythology of um, uh, central sleep apnea and then and look into it and then to phenotype it. So for the post-operative um, um, uh, monitoring may just look at the mythology of uh, central sleep apnea and then um, uh, we could estimate like uh, which phenotype it is. So, um, it certainly requires further research. But the other thing we need to look at is uh, the genotypes. Um, there's three uh, candidate genes uh, I presented just now. Um, the, um, um, uh, like the, uh, in parts of uh, my studies, given the same dose of opioid, there are like more than 30 times of a difference in um, plasma concentration, given the same dose of opioid. So um, people respond quite differently to, uh, to the same dose of opioid. And then uh, it could be genetically related. And then the two of the candidate genes are quite, um, um, are, are quite sensitive to the, uh, uh, to the um, uh, to the pharmacokinetic and the pharmacodynamic um, uh, 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 as I presented just now. So uh, I could uh, definitely I need a lot of further research to um, to 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 look uh, to look at like people's um, um, genetic profile and in terms of their central sleep apnea response as well. Thank you. Uh Thomas, before returning to Dr. Weingart, and I'll give you a chance to make a few concluding remarks because I think we're just about out of time. Well, I think if, um, if we can increase the awareness of the risks of obstructive sleep apnea in the post-operative setting, then, uh, then this webinar and, and, the, and, the, um, and the, the, May, uh, the May Journal um, has, has really done an important job because um, it's it's an underappreciated risk, I think, in the post-operative setting. And and as as we uh, as we do more research and we develop these methods of phenotyping better, then we will be able to develop more targeted strategies to reduce the risk post-operatively. Um, but if we can increase the awareness of of, uh, of those concepts, then that's going to be a, a very important thing. Thank, thank you. Now back for concluding remarks to Dr. Weingarten. Yeah, and I, I want to thank everybody who participated in today's panel and to Dr. Altry and Wang for uh, sharing, us, uh, sharing with us your, your papers in the recent edition and Dr. Hillman for helping me uh, co-host this. I'd also like to thank uh, the staff at ANA and IARS for hosting this uh, webinar. I want to ask everybody to, if you, if you found this topic interesting, to please look at the Society of Anesthesia and Sleep Medicine website. That's S-A-S-M-H-Q. We do have our a hybrid meeting in San Diego uh, this October, and we are open for abstracts if anyone would like to submit. I hope people found this exciting. I hope this generates further questions and further research in the future. And I'm looking forward to your submissions to our journal. Thank you. Thank you.